Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Denise Lee, and I am your moderator for today's Cisco Chat. The topic of today's Cisco Chat is small, medium businesses um, surviving and thriving uh, locally while making a global impact. I am so happy to have with me here today um, Josh Quick from Allbirds. Hey, Josh, how are you doing today? I'm good. Uh, Chris O'Dell from Mike Spikes. Glad to be here. Hey, Chris. Thanks. And Omar Zarabi, the founder and CEO of Port 53. Hey, hey, Omar. Hey, Denise. Thank you for having me this morning. Looking forward to the All conversation. Right. Absolutely. So just a reminder, we will be taking questions on any channel that you're watching from. So please don't be shy and load up your questions. We've got a great conversation queued up for today. Um, for those who may not know, this week is actually the National uh, Retail Federation Conference. It's, it's global, it's obviously virtual this year. Um, and I took a peek, and of the nine sessions, eight of them have technology and something digital in its description. Um, so it's a really timely discussion here, and, and I'm really excited to have um, such an esteemed group of, um, of panelists and, and guests today. So let's go ahead and, and, and talk about, gosh, what a year we've all had. Um, when, when we looked at a small business across Cisco early in the pandemic, we, we kind of partnered up with, with some analysts and put out this digital maturity index to kind of help um, businesses of any size just quickly identify where they were in their digital journey. Um, mostly because what we were finding was those who were more digitally mature were a little bit more resilient to all the changes that, um, that, that, that COVID and the pandemic around the world has caused. And so it hits the bottom line, it hits the top line, it hit growth, um, and it had such a major impact across businesses. So this quick digital maturity um, index, there's, there's a, you know, a very short assessment to it, but you can also look at it and just, there's only four buckets, like brief description, kind of am I, am I really just taking along, I don't really care whether or not I'm using technology and, and, and whether or not I've got, I've got the tools to help me scale, um, or am I, cloud native, digitally born, and I'm off to go. And you know what? The pandemic didn't really face me so much. In fact, there was actually a lot of growth in it. So I'm really happy to have um, these guys here today. I'm going to first open up the question to, to Josh and Omar talking about Allbirds and what role technology played in Allbirds growth. Uh, Josh, why don't you take it first? Yeah, so I mean, at Allbirds, we you are a five and a half year old company. Um, born in the cloud. So I took this assessment that we're in that stage three, stage four area. But yeah, we're being digital native cloud born. We leverage, you know, a lot of cloud partners and understanding what is the best solutions out there is a challenge, even in as a cloud native company. So trying to partner with companies like Cisco and, and Port 43 as our partner to really capitalize on the opportunities of being a cloud only uh, company. So we use, you know, products like Cisco, uh, Meraki, AMP and Umbrella. So those have really kind of helped us as a quickly growing company, being able to scale globally um, during all this. You say that so casually, like, oh, we're just a five year old company. Tell us how many stores do you guys have and kind of what growth has looked like um, in the last couple of years? Yeah, so I started just under three years ago and we were serving four countries through e-commerce and had two concept retail stores. And now we're serving 35 countries and have 27 retail stores across the world. It's, it's incredible. Um, Omar, can you maybe talk talk about, you know, how you partnered with Josh on this journey um, for growth and, and what role you guys played and what role the technology played in helping with that? Definitely. I think uh, it's important to uh, differentiate between uh, like digital transformation and, and, and digital maturity over here, right? And uh, Josh uh, hinted at the technology stack that we were able to deliver that really helped them. But before the technology, it really came down to uh, the processes, the people and the strategy that that uh, that all birds and Josh put into place. Um, if you think of an organization that's running across 35 different countries, you know, 27 different uh, locations, you would assume it's, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 person large enterprise organization. But, um, you know, by putting in these digital maturity sort of processes in place, not only around the technology, but really around the, the, the organization's processes, you know, streamlining the operations on the back end and ensuring that the people, you know, had the skill sets to take advantage of the technologies we put in place. 
allowed Josh and allowed t- the team over there to quickly and rapidly expand uh, to to serve this global market uh, without the need to you know hire on you know five thousand ten thousand employees to do so. So. Um, that technology definitely and that t- technology digital transformation helped them. Um, but it really came down to Josh and, and the team being uh, digital mature ready uh, in order to take on that technology. And that's really what we were uh, aiming to help Josh with. And, and, you know, I think it's super important for organizations as we get out of the pandemic. Yeah, that's great. I'm um, talking about getting out of the pandemic, Josh, what, what's kind of the next, the next hurdle or, or what do you, what do you focus on that from a tech, per- tech perspective, um, kind of helping your business? Yeah, so for the, you know, getting out of the pandemic, just as in IT, we're trying to plan the reopening of our office. So we're in the in the midst of that right now. I'm in our basement of our headquarters and we're <laughs> trying to de- design it to be, you know, handle that hybrid work environment. So how to be inclusive and bridge that digital divide of people that aren't comfortable yet being in the office while still yeah. um, making it a fun place and a collaborative place to to grow. Oh, that sounds great. Honestly, like going back to the office, I was on a call the other day and someone was saying, I actually had a dream. I went back into the office and we all kind of tussled about it. But uh, it's true. I mean, getting back in and and being able to work with people in person and get to a whiteboard and just that level of collaboration. There's only so far, um, as great as technology is, it's only so far it can take you. All right, let's kick um, let's kick it over to, to Chris and Mike Spikes. Can you tell us a little bit about Mike Spikes' journey and 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 the partnership that you've had with with Stratus and how technology um, has helped you guys? Where where are you on the digital maturity curve? Well, we sit pretty much right between three and four, um, which was fortunate for us because um, due to the unprecedented bike boom that we've seen in the last year. Um, we kind of found ourselves in a situation where we were desperately trying to scale um, in the midst of a pandemic. Also, while trying to maintain a lean, uh, a lean IT and technology crew, um, we needed to rapidly reconfigure the stores, obviously, uh, to keep serving customers during the lockdown. Fortunately, you know, we were bike shops were deemed uh, essential business um, because they totally are. But that put us in a situation where we suddenly had to move devices around, add devices here. You know, these devices suddenly went unused. So, and we became more dependent than ever on integrations between our website and, you know, the devices in the brick and mortar stores for looking at real-time inventory or being able to you know easily tell a customer you know from the front of the store because we're not letting them inside right so we've got kiosks set up and um we needed to be able to do things like quickly look up whether that bike you know you want that bike in green but we only have it in blue but we've got it in green at this store you know on, on the other side of the bay area over in Folsom and we can get that for you here tomorrow you know we needed to put solutions in place to let our yeah you know, have those kind of customer conversations and, and serve the customers quickly from, you know, different places than what they had been before lockdown. Um, I would yeah, say, absolutely. You know, from my perspective as a CTO uh, with a very lean tech crew, uh, Meraki Hardware and uh, Meraki Systems Manager um, were the right tech for me. Uh, at the right time to help get that done. So, Chris, can you talk a little bit about I mean your your journey with with Mike Spikes? And I mean, certainly you weren't um, you know Mike Spikes was a local shop when when Mike Spikes first started. I don't know that the cloud was even around. Um, so, can you talk well, a little bit about that? That was 1964. So, um, <laughs> and uh, in theory, there was even an original Mike. I, I get that question all the time. You know, well, who's Mike? Does he yeah. still work there? All I know is that when, you know, Ken Martin, CEO, purchased the company, um, he purchased it from a guy named Dave. So uh, I think I think Mike is <laughs> largely a problem. Um, uh, my journey with Mike's, uh, I've been here for three years, um, coming from a background in uh, wholesale distribution and, and, and uh, B2B. So um, you know, since coming in, We've, I think that on that digital maturity scale, when I came in, we were probably 
around a two. And, you know, through implementing more cloud based tech and transitioning away from on prem, um, we've been moving up the ladder. So, and that, that, yeah. that actually was quite fortuitous that some of those initiatives were able to get done before 2020 because it put us in a, in a better sure. place. Huge. I mean, I think that was, it was almost like 2020 put a big spotlight on like, ready or not, it's here. So everyone freeze and you're stuck with what you've got. I mean, if you look at supply chain right now, um, in almost any industry that you're in, supply chain has been massively affected, but even at, at, at a small scale for the distribution. I know at our at our local bike shop, um, there is a three and a half month wait for a tune-up uh, or even getting some, some new things. So yeah, supply it's, chain uh, is very, been yeah. a huge problem. Uh, and, and, and a continuing one for us. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, and, and the role technology plays in a lot of that. Oh, go ahead, Omar. No, you, you said it perfectly. You know, us working with thousands of SMB organizations across the nation, that's one thing we definitely, you know, saw right off the bat the first month, month and a half of the pandemic is uh, how ready people were for that shift. Um, you know, there were organizations who were more on the digital ready scale regardless of what industry they were in. And seemingly overnight, they were able to, you know, continue business as is. Whereas the organizations that weren't and that were really very much so digital and different um, had a much, much more difficult challenge in, in uh, you know, getting accustomed to this new way of work and this hybrid, uh, you know, work environment. Um, and I think that's going to be true coming out of the pandemic as well. So more than ever, digital maturity for organizations, regardless of size, is important. And uh, that's why I think it's a very timely conversation today that we're having. Oh, that's perfect. Um, so we actually put together um, a really great video kind of showing the, the journey of, of Mike Spikes, but also the role that technology played. Um, and it sort of segues into that that small business, local, um, you know, local journey with global impact. Um, and that's really what I love so much about today's topic. So let's go ahead and roll the video. I believe that the more people who are on bikes, the better off the world will be. Every single person who has bought a bike from us or anybody else has had their life impacted in a positive way by that bike. It is never easy to think big and stay close to your roots. That's a really hard balance to find. The challenge is getting to a level where you're able to offer all the things that a big company offers while still maintaining that heart and soul of a small corner bike shop. We are in the middle of a bike boom right now like we've never seen before as people rediscover cycling. It's caused us to rethink everything about how we do business. We want to be a bike shop for everybody and meet the rider where they are. The use of technology is really what allows us to do that and make that experience great across any channel that you happen to be shopping with us. Having technology that's secure, really solid and robust that works in the background allows me to leverage other parts of the business so I can be thinking about the things that really matter to me. We started the Mike Spikes Foundation and the goal was to find a way to distribute donated bikes across Africa in a sustainable way. We try to assign value to these bikes that give pride of ownership of the bike. And then we train local entrepreneurs on how to run bike shops that will keep all these bikes running. Every single time I go there, I'm astounded at the difference that bikes make in people's lives. And those bikes and those little shops have kickstarted a whole bike community. There's a bike culture there and it's building on itself. All bike shops are important. Whether you're Mike's Bikes or whether you're a mom and pop on the corner, you know, you're still making a difference in people's lives. And every butt you put on a bike is a big difference you made in the world. I never get tired of uh, watching that video. It makes me want to go get my butt on a bike and, and get out there. <laughs> um, what's, what's so amazing to me about both that video and, and, and about Allbirds as well is the global impact both of these companies have. Um, so let's, let's first start and, and kick it over to, um, to Chris this time. 
Can you talk to a little bit about the mission of Mike Spike Foundation, kind of how that came about? Um, I just it's such a great story. The video obviously shares a little bit about it, but would love would love to know just a little bit more about about how that came about and how technology has played a role uh, in that in that impact. Well, I think I can. I mean, I agree with Ken wholeheartedly that the world um, would be a much better place with more people on bikes. And I know his vision for achieving that um, has grown out of a long, you know, a long history of, um, well, it's also tied up in the Mike Spikes core values. You know, two of our core, core values are uh, the greater good and continuous improvement. So I think, you know, those two things together, um, you know, Ken saw an opportunity to spread the philosophy worldwide. Yeah. And uh, I'm super proud to be you know, helping with that. Every time I see you know, bikes being loaded into that container, because the, the container where these, you know, ultimately they, they, they come into our distribution facility and get loaded into a container that sits outside. We've got a fancy, you know, My Spikes Foundation, uh, banner on the side of it so uh, as i come and go i'm always noticing you know, one container will go another container will show up i think we're up to 75 or 76 containers now that have, oh, that have that's amazing come and gone um and you know on the other side of that on the other side of that journey you know these bikes aren't just providing recreation but this is a Oh yeah, transportation infrastructure and kind of a life changing, uh, a life changing things for, for these folks. So you know, I, I hope um, as we move forward with technology to be able to advance what the foundation is doing and allow you know maybe the, the folks that donate the bikes to connect with you know the ultimate recipients of the bikes or see more of what happens at the other end of the journey in Africa you know, by, by helping those shops to increase, you know, their uh, technology resources. And that's something that, you know, we're going to be working on. That's cool as a next step. I've, I've actually had the opportunity to do some, this is a prior life, um, to do some work in uh, global health in sub-Saharan Africa. And you're right, like bikes and transportation, not only is, is, is a lifeline for a lot of these folks, but it actually allows a lot of them to start their own businesses. I mean, microfinancing is a massive industry um, in Africa for just that reason. Um, so technology plays a role there. I, I love I love the fact that you guys aren't just donating bikes, but you're helping people um, over there start bike shops and not learn how to um, continue to keep the bikes running, right? Because ultimately it's just one, one um, hardware thing away from a bike not working, you need to make sure that they know how to use them and tune them up. But I think right. there's also um, a, a sustainability um, kind of component to that as well, which is really cool. Well, absolutely. I think that's, you know, that's part of what I think is most cool about the foundation is that it's not, you know, it's not simply send bikes to Africa and feel good about it. It's it's setting up a self-sustaining infrastructure on the yeah. other end to where, yeah. um, you know, distributors grow and then they support proud shops and in, in farther, you know, in, in, in more rural areas. Um, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So I know that it's something that's great. Ken is passionate about, and you know that that you know, passion is contagious sometimes, right? So I can um, I can see that. that. that everybody at everybody at Mike's, you know, this is a, a super positive thing that everybody's really happy about, and uh, yeah, that's great. I think there's often a misnomer that small businesses are only kind of locally impacting, right? And I think that this really blows that out of the water um, in terms of the reach. I mean, 75 containers, I can't even imagine how many bikes that is. That is a lot of bikes. And that's, um, it's really remarkable. I'm, I'm excited to kind of continue to, uh, to watch that journey um, and to donate my children's bikes when they outgrow them. Um, <laughs> let's, let's, turn it, let's turn it over to, um, to Albert and, and this is, you know, on that on that trend of sustainability and global impact. I mean, man, talk about talk about a retail company kind of changing changing the game. Um, Josh, can you can you talk to us a little bit about the the sustainability mission of Albert? 
Yeah, definitely. And that was one of the big uh, reasons I joined Allbirds was I wanted to, you know, do something that is good for the environment. So the fact that Allbirds has always been a public benefits corporation, a B Corp, you know, is a, is a big driver in a lot of our decisions. Um, it was fun coming in here and just asking uh, which monitors to buy. I was presented with, you need to make sure they're EAP certifications and really understand the full life cycle of everything that we buy you know, in the corporate world as well as in our actual product uh, environment. So that's a big thing. And then a lot of work we're doing with open sourcing these technologies. So our green EVA that we work on for the bottom of our shoes, that's we make it available to to everyone and that kind of just helps the global community you know be more sustainable so that makes a huge global impact versus just keeping it to ourselves yeah i don't know how many people caught that but in the, in the first picture there is um there was a score up there um you, you, know, you, you mentioned a little bit like the carbon score um the, the idea of open sourcing the the products and the basically the ingredients you have for some of these materials is just um it's, it's that greater good, right? It's that global impact. Can you talk to us a little bit more about how that's come about and how, how to read, you know, how technology has maybe played a role in sharing um, not only that story, that mission, but I would, I would imagine it, it kind of helps impact the growth as well. Yeah, so the, the carbon score we've been working on for a long time and, you know, that really is technology driven. You know, having that data, being a D2C brand, knowing all the shipping costs and whether it's, you know, airship versus freight ship, the boat, um, and having that level of detail into the whole life cycle of our products was definitely critical in designing that carbon score. And then this last Earth Day, we decided to kind of release the formula on how we're calculating it and the assets around that so that it's more than just, like I said, more than just all birds, it's allowing other brands and kind of becoming that nutrition label on products so that people can compare and make that sustainable decision for them. Yeah, uh, and then Omar, can you talk to us a little bit about you know how you how you approach such a wide base of your your customers in the in the small medium space um, around the local you know they want to thrive locally, and I think a lot of people are just looking at small businesses as just trying to survive locally. Um, but those that are actually making that that global impact, can you talk to us a little bit about um, about the role you might do to assist them on the technology side there? Definitely. Yeah, I think um, you know when you look at a lot of small and mid-sized businesses, like you mentioned, uh, a lot of the individuals there are, are, are business operators, right? They're in the business on a day-in and day-out basis. They're working a lot on the operations just to keep afloat. And that's, I think, where the true value of digital transformation and digital maturity comes into place. Um, by us coming in and, and really understanding where they are, what their processes are, what their operations is, and then seeing, you know, what we could sort of automate or what we could take off the plate, uh, which then in turn gives them the ability to focus on what they want to focus on uh, is invaluable, regardless of what industry that organization is uh, is in. So, um, you know, I've seen personally growing up the impact that technology can have in terms of an operator, business operator's uh, um, time. And, and uh, you know, one perfect example is our family business that I grew up in. My father, uh, you know, used to write invoices to clients uh, on, on those old little invoice books. I don't know if you remember those with the invoice yeah. and the copy of right. the invoices, the, the pink and the orange ones that you rip out. Uh, but then when we moved sure. over to like QuickBooks Online, I, I, I'll never forget so that allowed him, that freed up a ton of his time and it allowed him really focus on the products and, and, and the solutions that we're bringing to, to the market and, and to those stores over there. Uh, same exact thing with Josh, you know, with, and with Allbirds. Um, he mentioned right there that the carbon score that they were able to come up with, um, that's absolutely amazing, really kind of looking at every shoe and having a, like, a, like a nutrition sort of score uh, around what it took to get that uh, shoe, you know, to, to, to that individual, to that consumer that was all technology driven, right? And, um, you know, before five, 10 years ago, if Josh was running a shoe store, uh, he would have had to spend all of his time in just upkeeping with the technology stack, you know, keeping the POS systems up, keeping the laptops, uh, you know, running, keeping the lights on. But us bringing that technology stack, um, you know, and, and taking that uh, sort of networking operations, the security, cybersecurity operations off the table for him allows him to now focus and, and really leverage technology to, for that greater good. So, 
um, you know, whether you're a small business or a large enterprise, I think, uh, you know, having that social uh, responsibility is, is becoming more and more prevalent in the business world uh, and having, you know, ties to that social impact and that social responsibility. I think the private sector needs to step up to the plate, uh, you know, a lot more than they have historically. Uh, and I think technology is going to allow us to do that, uh, like we're seeing with with Allbirds and, and the work that Josh is putting in. Um, you know, not just to operate the business and keep the business running, but to work on these exciting new technologies and, and, and new solutions over here. Yeah, no, I love that. Addition, it's interesting, you know, when you when you think about these two different companies, um, Allbirds and Mike Spikes, you know, one is born in the cloud. One, you know, again, was founded before the cloud even existed. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, the work it takes to maintain, you know, Staying in that in that kind of stage four, right? Your your cloud, your cloud native, you're digitally mature. Um, is it easy to just you, you got there, you're done, you don't have to think about it anymore? Um, you know, for for my spice, you're kind of in between three and four. I would imagine. Again, you you talked about it, it obviously didn't start there when you when you joined. Um, what goes through your mind when you're going through that constant? You know, do I have the right vendors? Am I comfortable with with the technology strategy kind of as is? Maybe let's start with uh, let's start with Chris. All right, the technology strategy. Yeah, just where you are on the digital maturity curve. Like you're, you said you're kind of in between three and four. Um, right. you're, you're good with that. Do you like kind of what's what's next and. How do you how do you handle like when new technology comes up? Like, do you need that? Do you not need that? What goes through what goes through your head? <laughs> well, you know, one of our core values being continuous improvement. You know, I absolutely can't say that we're merely okay. You know, we're okay being being merely at level three. Um, you know, we absolutely want to continue innovating, and I think you know, in evaluating new technology. You know, that, that's kind of one of my challenges as CTO, you know, especially, you know, in, in, in recent years, there's such a huge volume of new technology coming down the pipe yeah. all the time. You know, some of it makes sense for the business. Some of it might not make sense for the business, you know, but at all, what I try to keep in mind is I always try to tie it back to the customer experience, you know, when I'm evaluating a particular type of, of technology, you know, is, is it going to improve or impact the customer experience? Is it going to increase the efficiency of the business in a way that allows us to better serve the customer? You know, if it doesn't meet that litmus test, then, you know, it, it gets deprioritized. Um, but, you know, in, in the retail space, uh, there are actually quite a few ways, I think, in the next couple of years that we're going to bring technology even even more into play with more mobile devices in the in the stores mm -hmm. and you know, we're looking at an initiative for digital shelf tags also that you know, that will let a customer come up and if they're interested in a bike you know they tap their phone on the tag it's got nfc and you know, they can go straight to the product details you know there's um and all of this stuff will be cloud-based so i think like for us we're we're, we're kind of on a, on a on a mission to get to that um, stage four of digital maturity yeah that's great and how about how about you josh you guys are cloud native you're kind of our born in the four um what does that decision making process look like on a day-to-day -day basis yes and i mean as we scale it becomes especially as a larger global company being able to really evaluate some of these, you know, large enterprise softwares aren't, you know, designed for a cloud first brand like us. So working with those, you know, products to make sure that they can handle an AD list environment or they can handle some of these things that a cloud native company deals with. So, you know, really focusing on, you know, identity protection and security and um, not having this siloed, um, data center world, you know, really focus on least privilege access. And so really just kind of working with these large enterprise products as we start bringing them on to meet this, you know, large global scale that we're, we're hitting. Um, that way we don't kind of start leaning back towards the other end of that index. So it is a challenge, yeah. especially as we continue to grow. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, and, and Omar, I mean, you, you talk about 
needing to help at, at scale, right? And, and your stories, I think, are so are so relevant to the, the benefit of technology helping um, these small businesses. Um, talk to us about how you guys might use the, uh, the digital maturity uh, index. Yeah. Definitely. So we're, we have been using the digital maturity index, um, not in necessarily a formal manner, but that is a lot of you know how our engagements are with our customers to begin with. It all starts with an understanding of how they're engaging with technology, how they're using it, and what they're aiming to do long term, and where they are today with with, with that. So um, you know, I think uh, um, just having that baseline understanding uh, of of the technologies that, and, and the way you're delivering to your customers and reaching your customers, uh, leveraging technologies is extremely important, and then um, a couple of things to really understand in, in today's way of, wor uh, way of work, a lot of organizations need to understand whether you're a small business or a large business that the world has changed. It's not just the way of work that has changed, you know, with this hybrid work model and, and you know, cloud computing and everything like that. It's also the way consumers engage with uh, with their, with their uh, you know, vendors and, and with the brands that they want to engage with. That's changed drastically as well. Um, so really being able to be front and center and, and, and be where your consumers are and where your customers are is going to be absolutely critical. So when we engage with the customer, that's the, the next thing we really want to understand is, hey, where are your customers? How are you reaching them right now? And are you sure that's how you're going to be able to reach them a year from now, two years, five years from now? Because the way yeah. they're engaging with you is changing. So really keeping that and keeping that customer experience top of mind is absolutely critical. Um, and then from there, the next step is just uh, what we talked about is, is streamlining the efficiencies of that business, really understanding how, you know, technology, how cloud computing, especially in a secure manner, can impact uh, you know the 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 the, the employees' effectiveness. You know the way they get work done, how how efficiently they can work done, get work done, and how you know technology can give their not only workforce but their entire organization a competitive advantage in their industry. Uh, is the, the the next way we engage with them, and then lastly, the conversations we have with all of our small businesses. I think um, sustainability is is very critical for a small and mid sized business. I mean, we all know that nine out of ten uh, you know small businesses fail within the first two years, right? So. Wanting to stay, you know, and, and, and sustain your business long term, if that is a goal of a small business and, and, and if a goal of a small business is to grow into a larger organization, you know, like we've seen with Allbirds uh, over the last couple of years, um, and technology is a critical part of that more than ever today. And really having them understand that if you do want to scale uh, in today's world, you have to be in that, you know, level three or level four digital native uh, environment, uh, not only with your technology, but with, across your entire processes, across your entire systems um, is absolutely critical. So those are the three ways we really engage uh, and yeah. really try to get our customers to understand the importance of digital maturity today more than ever. That's perfect. Thank you. So let's go ahead and open it up to questions. I know we've got a couple, um, so we'll go. We'll move to the Q and A portion of uh, of of the program here. Uh, the first one is, how important is it to unify the customer experience across brick and mortar stores and digital platforms? Um, what do Allbirds and Mike Bikes do in this area? Yeah, I can speak on that. Um, you know, we early on partnered with Shopify on both. Uh, mostly on the e-commerce to start because we were e-commerce only, but then working with them on their POS offering to make it in a, in a spot that could work for you know our the scale that we were going to. So right now we have a pretty seamless uh, in-person versus uh, offline transaction workflow, so people can buy online, pick up in store, and um, that's great. All those different things. So yeah, I think it's super critical, especially during the pandemic, where people weren't comfortable going into the store, but maybe needed to return in the store. So yeah, yeah, same for my spikes. Um, extremely critical, especially in the last year. Um, we also use Shopify, and being able to unify the inventory visibility was critical for us because. You know, if, if someone was going to come out during the pandemic to go to the bike shop to get a bike. You know, they wanted to know in advance, you know, did we have the bike? Did they have to wait for the bike to come from another place? So that's where, you know, having um, that tight integration allow both the customer and, you know, our staff to pretty easily get the bike that the customer wanted and give them an experience where they only had to, they only had to come out once and stand in line, yeah. you know, at the door to get their bike. So, um, yeah, it's, it's super critical. Um, I am a, if, if online shopping was a sport, I could probably compete in it. And uh, 
the number of apps that are out there and that have really taken off. I mean, obviously Shopify is, is a common, commonly known one today. There's another one called Shop that takes all of any ordering you do and, and shows you the supply chain of it. it and, and that includes returns. And it's, it's just fascinating how so many apps are getting created because of um, this contactless hybrid virtual space. Um, and it really cuts across every every industry. Um, and I don't know. I, I just think it's so fascinating that these these little devices. I, I was at um, I was at Apple when the very first iPhone came out, and they're like, "Steve Jobs, this is going to change the world." And at the time, you're like, "Haha, that's funny." Um, but fast forward, and you're like, "Everything is my life is managed through these apps." Okay, next question. Um, how do you send people out to set up new stores, or do you do it remotely? Well, um, we had we haven't opened a new My Spikes in, in a couple of years, but we did have um, a recent experience over in Berkeley where we effectively opened a new store. But it was mostly it was a relocation. We needed to move the Berkeley store from one end of the street, literally maybe I think eight blocks the other way, into a different, much better building. And you know. To be honest, there's a lot of things that you can do remotely, but opening a brick and mortar store, 90 plus percent of that effort, you know, isn't isn't in that bucket, right? Like there's a lot of um, blood, sweat and tears that goes into that. For my part, though, from a technology standpoint, um, it was very seamless for me because most of the preparation from a technology standpoint was done remotely you know for me it was mostly you know, since i'm you know with the meraki gear it actually makes it pretty easy for me to configure everything in advance and then i just hand it off to the facility people and say put this box here you know <laughs> and then yeah. it's just a matter of showing up once to you know connect a couple cables and then and then we're good so um you know especially now that we've got more converged services you know all the phones are VoIP phones um the cameras are all ip you know ip based so now that now that everything is converging you know around ethernet and cloud services um, i think as we open uh new stores in the future you know, it's, it's only going to get faster and easier yeah that's great how about you josh i know all birds has exploded in growth so do you clone yourself or are you uh, are you able to do some of that remotely i i, I tried that uh didn't work yeah. out so well. uh <laughs> but yes so we partner with uh, a couple different companies to help with the remote setup of the store so i only we only fly out technology people if there's like major issues or for international launches um but we were actually able to um, we opened our second store in Tokyo just a few wow. weeks ago. And that was like the first international store that we weren't able to fly at because of all the restrictions of COVID. So we that one we had to do completely remote. And so partnering really heavily with local vendors um, and a lot of late night calls. But yeah, we're able to, you know, since like uh, Chris said, like being able to use all this technology and all this Meraki gear and void phones and Shopify POS um, and MDMs were able to do majority of the setup completely remote. So a lot of it is just just plugging in. So it's just getting that local vendor to help make sure everything is plugged into the right, right spot. It's kind of fun. It's like technology it puts. Uh... Oh, we just lost you. Denise, you're muted. Denise, you're muted. Hey, Denise, I think you're muted right now. We cannot hear you. Just adds up. Okay. Denise, you're muted. Sorry, we cannot hear you. <laughs> Hello? Chris and Josh, is that you guys as well? Or did I just lose the audio over here? <laughs> no, it's, it's not you. Uh -huh. I don't know whether it's part of the, the hybrid hybrid world we live in now. The hybrid world. There you go. The work from home challenges over here that yeah. we're all. If I had a dime for every time I've Sorry. forgotten the mute button. 
<laughs> Sorry, everyone, we're having a, a little technical difficulty here, but we did have some additional questions come through. So uh, let me just jump in in Denise's place for a minute here uh, and ask you some of these questions that we had coming through. Um, we had a question from Joanna. Uh, this is to you, Chris. Uh, does Mike Spikes do local charity work as well? All right. Go. Um, yes. That was my cell connection. Oh, great. <laughs> Denise, you're back. I will uh, hand back over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. That was cell connection, not uh, not 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 the network. Um, but I think I think the question was was around what was kind of the most important factor that kept your business growing since last year. Okay. Um, well, that's yeah, an easier just, question you know, for me to answer than the. And the charity and the charity <laughs> aspect. I know that 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 just to touch on to touch on both. Um, sure. Mike Mike does do uh, local charity work. They also partner with um, you know a variety of local cycling organizations. I know that we're associated with the Marin um, Marin Cycling Association. I know there's a mountain bike uh, high school. I think I, I believe the Marin school system has a mountain biking team um, i know my spice also donated for the uh, stafford lake uh, bike park right down here in novato also so um you know both from a corporate level and from uh, an individual store level you know there's initiatives at both levels there's also store level initiatives for you know the managers of our uh, locations to get involved locally in their communities as well so um yeah definitely yes on that and you know as far as the other question i believe denise you said it was what's the most important thing that's kept the business going mm -hmm. um you know through the pandemic wow um you know i would say relationships um i i think if i had you know there's a technological answer and then there's a um there's an overarching answer and i think the overarching answer is the relationships that you know the staff at our stores has forged with people in their local community really has been yeah. the key um because you know without that you know without without that relationship and without getting you know folks a good customer experience and you know knowing their face when they come in the store and i mean i've personally seen this as i've been in various stores working on various things that you know people come into the shop you know with a flat tire or wanting to talk about an upgrade and i can't even tell you the number of times that you know the sales associate that is close to me you know knows that customer's name yeah that's um, great you know so I, i've seen firsthand a lot of um how those relationships you know power the store um and then you know lay lay technology across the top of it especially you know in the context of a pandemic you know between you know having the online business channel having sms texting you can text back and forth to the store you know if you're you know um there's multiple channels for you to forward that relationship you know between the people of the store and the customer so um yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's been continuing to facilitate that important customer relationship and being able yeah. to change the way that that works, uh, you know, kind of on a dime because of the pandemic. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I, plus one for the relationship side. I mean, I think through this whole thing that, that can apply uh, in every faucet of the business, even technology, right? The relationships you have with, with your yeah. vendors, with the partners, um, when things inevitably either go wrong or you just need a lot more of it or you need to shift very quickly. Um, Josh, how about you? What, what have you seen at Allbirds is kind of the, the one thing that that kind of comes to mind. And then maybe yeah, we'll just wrap up with one final question. Yeah, I think definitely uh, the more I think about it is just staying humble. Um, really, I think pre-pandemic, we were very like micro into very small transaction things and kind of helped broaden our realization of everything going on in the world and, and what the bigger picture is. Um, one of the things that we decided to do was was donate 
over a million dollars worth of shoes to frontline healthcare workers um, mm-hmm. during the middle of it. And that was uh, so interesting on the technology aspect. And we learned a lot from it. It actually broke our, our email, our G Suite <laughs> email for a few hours because of the demand. <laughs> we decided to launch it by having people email into customer support, which um, was, <laughs> was a, a fun challenge to get over. But yeah, it's just really reestablishing, really thinking about community as a whole and how we can just yeah. really benefit everybody. And that, yeah, we'll get over this and then it'll be, yeah, then we'll be back to business, so. That's right. I can't tell you the number of my doctor friends uh, who are running around in all words, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, okay, I've got two questions around security. I'm gonna try to combine them as sort of a, a last uh, last kind of big question, then we'll, then we'll wrap. Um, thinking about this increase to remote work and privacy and security and cloud, there's lots of concerns around and always ongoing conversations. Um, how do you, you know, how do you how do you put the right strategy around security without constantly adding more and more um, users um, to pre- to prevent the latest or uh, you know weakest link, so to speak? You know, for my part, I would say fundamental best practices, you know, for security haven't really changed all that much. Um, I mean, you know, the, the threats evolve, you know, the the there's always that back and forth between threats and response. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, what I do on a, on a day-to-day basis to you know, try to keep security in a good place hasn't changed dramatically over the years. You know, you got to reduce your attack footprint by having good visibility of all your networking, um, you know, what's, you know, it, it, what ports are open, what attack vectors are um, being actively exploited by folks, right? Like, like that, that's, that's kind of where having, you know, great network visibility for me is, is a key component of this, is being able to see on the security report, oh, you know, I still have a legacy DVR out here that's getting hammered on, you know, all day long by people trying to, you know, exploit the old OS or, um, you know, when you look at the, the, the report from Umbrella, <laughs> you know, also, um, you know, but, uh, you know, thanks to good networking tools and, you know, a fairly consistent policy on, you know, how users interact with technology, you know, good onboarding strategy, good offboarding strategy, you know, some of these fundamental components, um, you, you have to have a, if you have a good foundation for security, then you know as new threats come down the pipeline, you know adapting to them is much easier. How about you, Josh? Um, security side. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, just like Chris, it's all about you know reducing the blast radius, as my boss calls it, um, and just setting up those uh, at least privilege access has really been my focus. You know, since I started here, you know, making sure that if something does get out like an API key or things like that, that it's minimal, that, you know, we set up uh, data security standards for different levels of data. So customer data and employee data and payment information is, you know, critical to secure. So making sure that all those things are extremely locked down. And then, yeah, like partnering with, with Omar and Port 53 on a lot of the Cisco solutions and even some of their managed services to help offset a lot of our, you know, nimble team to help really have experts in that space has been critical. Yeah, that's great. All right, final last fun fun thought. Um, I, the next the next picture I want to see is someone riding a Mike's bike with wearing Allbirds. I think that that would be a really great a great shot there, <laughs> representing small business and global impact. Um, I want to thank the audience and what's that? The collab is always good. That's right. There yeah, you go. Denise, just uh, one thing to say about the cybersecurity piece, especially for small and mid-sized businesses. Um, I think first and foremost, the most important thing uh, is to actually have a strategy in place to begin with. A lot of times, yeah. uh, you know, especially with uh, you know the the rapid change of technology and and the impact of technology within the business world right now, what we're starting to see is that cybersecurity is becoming a bigger concern. But that uh, that concern and that responsibility is falling on a lot of IT teams 
general IT directors, IT managers. Um, you know, there's a I think a three million uh, you know person shortage when it comes to cybersecurity job availability right now. So, um, you know, understanding that you know these IT directors and IT generalists are now having to also be responsible for IT security. We've seen that a lot yeah. of them are approaching it in a reactive manner, right? It's really ad hoc. It's piecemeal together, and that leads to even if you are going about it with best practices, it leads to an incongruent, uh, you know, and sort of siloed security environment. So. Um, having a strategy in place, you know, understanding, you know, hey, here's where we are, uh, here's where we want to be in terms of maturity uh, and in terms of risk, uh, you know, appetite is absolutely critical. And, and that's really what we work with IT generalists and SMB organizations across the board to, to help them in doing is understanding where we are today, where we want to be. And when you look at maturity of a cybersecurity stack, it's tracked by rigor. Uh, so how proactive is it? You know, there's bad actors coming at your organization. Are you just, you know, one person trying to defend against that? Or do you have an integrated mm -hmm. platform yeah. that's leveraging massive amounts of data and is proactive in its ability to block those threats before it ever reaches your networks, your users, your endpoints, or your or, or your devices there? So, um, you know, leveraging that integrated yeah. platform approach and then having a partner, uh, you know, or having an individual or having another organization or bringing on, a, you know, somebody uh, to really work with you on strategy. Hey, here's yeah. what steps we need to take in order to increase our rigor, in order to increase our integrations and in turn you know de-risk our environment is going to be absolutely critical today but as technology becomes more and more prevalent in the business world yeah that's huge i mean the, the use of the increasing use of both managed service and just managing the sheer number of vendors that you have in all that space it becomes so important um i know we're coming up on time and i, I want to thank everyone for the great questions and thank the audience for tuning in um and a, a big special thanks to to omar uh josh and chris Thank you guys so much, and hopefully you guys can track the growth of all birds and night spikes as great examples for small businesses making a global impact. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If we're to build a bridge to an inclusive future, then getting healthcare to everyone, everywhere is critical. Take rural Europe, where local doctors leaving for big cities is creating a medical desert. For patients left behind, many lack the mobility or the flexibility to reach critical urban appointments. The remedy, it turns out, is as much a technological marvel as it is a medical one. Meet Medibus, a state-of-the-art clinic on four wheels. But designing such a wonder came with its own